So good afternoon, everybody. As Jim says, nice to see so many of you here this afternoon. So yes, guaranteed, no physics, no equations in this one. It's all about <laughs> nice pictures. And that's really what it is. It's not really a talk. It's more an excuse to show some of my favorite wildlife photos that I've taken. I've been going on African safaris with some friends of mine for the last 10, 20 years or so, every few years, whenever we could afford it. And so here's an excuse to show some of those images. Along the way, I'll say a little bit about a few hints and tips as to how to take these photos, these sorts of photos, and a little bit of the technicalities for those interested in the mechanics of photography, something about shutter speeds, apertures, etc., and things to watch out for if you're trying to do wildlife photography for yourself. The intention is to allow you to get a little bit more, perhaps, out of uh, photography if this is an interest of yours. And it doesn't really matter whether the photography is taking pictures of animals on African safaris or whether it's taking pictures in your back garden. So I'll be looking at a few ideas, the idea of composition and framing the subject. I'll be looking at uh, focus. I'll be looking at uh, lighting using natural light shutter speed and lens aperture, how that affects the images that you're taking. And thinking about the context, if you're trying to photograph animals, especially animals in their natural habitat rather than animals in a cage in a zoo, then thinking about the context, the background of what you're photographing. And finally, one very important part of photography is serendipity. Just getting lucky, being in the right place at the right time to happen to catch the animal or the bird, whatever it might be, just at the right time. So firstly, let's think about composition. If you're interested in going on safari, does that mean that the animals are going to be quite some distance away? The Serengeti is a big place. So does that mean that you need to have a whopping great telephoto lens in order to be able to do any sort of sensible wildlife photography? <laughs> You've got to admire the biceps of this particular individual holding a telephoto lens like that. Some people do believe that if you want to photograph birds, especially at a great distance, then you, need, you do need a whopping great telephoto lens. But after going on safari quite a few times, I have found that the ideal lens for me is a 300 millimeter lens on a digital SLR camera. Um, obviously, you might have other cameras, bridge cameras, um, etc or perhaps mirrorless cameras these days, but I find a telephoto lens of about 300 millimeters is all I need, and you can see the physical size of the lens there. It only, only weighs a few hundred grams. It's not many kilos to carry around. So it's nice and compact in the luggage, and if you happen to have it on the camera body strapped around your neck, it doesn't give you a great deal of neck pain, so I think that's fantastic. And I have found that you don't need huge telephotos that can take a picture of a bird from six miles away. Generally speaking, that's enough. So for instance, you ask, well, can you get close enough to the animals if you're going on safari to actually get nice images? For instance, like this beautiful uh, male lion pointing into the wind so that the wind is fluffing his mane out quite nicely. Well, can you get close to animals? Well, yes, you can. That's a picture taken by a friend of mine of my left ear and the lion showing you that uh, when you're on safari, you can get quite close to some animals. I say some animals. The higher they are in the food chain, the less likely they are to run away. Lions haven't got many enemies. They know that uh, visitors are going to shoot them with cameras, not with rifles, so they don't run away. If you're at the bottom of the food chain, you're a little bit more skittish, and so you might run away when somebody comes along trying to photograph you. But in general, the distance to animals is not that much of a problem when you're on safari. So for instance, here we have a female lion, a lioness, sitting on uh, a bough of a tree, very conveniently um, posing for us. In this particular case, her cubs were in the long grass in the distance there, where you can't see them. So her cubs were in the distance, we were here, and the lioness sat on the bough of this tree to put herself between us and her cubs to make sure her cubs were safe. Once the cubs had gone out of the long grass, she came out and then walked away. But for uh, two or three minutes, she was quite nicely sitting on that bough. But only for a few seconds did she turn her head to the left to give us a beautiful profile of the, uh, of the lioness on the log. 
So I only had a few seconds to take that picture, and only when I got home did I think, well, maybe the framing could have been a bit different. I quite like the idea of take the picture to make sure it's in the can, as it were, and then, perhaps, later, you might decide, well, actually, that might look better if it was framed slightly differently. What if I had instead moved the camera over? But, of course, with a picture, you can always crop it differently when you get home. The important thing is to catch the picture at the time, and then maybe you decide to crop it slightly differently. So the splash screen of this particular presentation was a crop of the slightly bigger image. But that's the beauty of digital imaging. It's very easy. Just decide, I'm not going to take the whole image. I'm just going to crop it down. And similarly, that picture of a lion looks very, perhaps, uninteresting until you realize it's part of a larger picture and the rest of the picture actually shows that the lion is actually going down to drink and you can see a reflection of the lion. Not only that, you notice that the reflection of the lion also shows a reflection of the lioness, which you don't see at the top there, but you do if you take the entire image. The lioness is actually sitting there in the background, but you can see that you can crop this one image in lots of different ways and you get a slightly different picture each time. I would argue the, the most interesting one is, the, is perhaps the one without the lioness at the top, but then you get the peak of the reflection of the lioness towards the bottom of the water. So again, you take the picture as it happens, and then perhaps you decide later, hmm, maybe a slightly different crop would look more interesting. Let's have a look at focus. It's fairly obvious that, generally speaking, it's good to have the, the subject of your image in focus. But if you're taking a picture like this, bear in mind, depending on the camera that you're using, I would like to get the, the snout or the whiskers of the animal in focus, so that's probably what I focused on for this particular image. And of course, the background will be out of focus because it's some meters behind the, the, uh, the lioness in this particular case. But you have to be careful as to, well, what is your camera going to focus on? Maybe you've got a camera in which you can decide where the focus is, but in some cameras, the camera decides on what it's going to focus on. And it might decide to focus on a number of different things in the image. And some cameras are programmed to say, well, it's obviously the closest thing to the camera that's the interesting thing. Because usually that's the case. When you're taking a portrait of somebody, then generally speaking, that somebody is the closest thing to the camera. And there's other clutter in the background. And so some cameras are programmed to look at a picture like that and to say, well, I'll look at focus all over the place. That's the closest thing to the camera, so that's what I'm going to focus on. So beware if your camera is set up that way. In other words, know what your camera is doing before you go out and try and photograph animals and then say, well, that didn't look to be focused the way I intended. Make sure you know what your camera is doing. In this particular case, for instance, the bird in the tree there, uh, a robin chat, I believe that is, you can see that there's an out-of-focus branch and a few leaves in front of the bird. And if you're not very careful, the camera might decide to focus on the branch and the leaves. The camera, remember, is stupid. No matter how much the manufacturers tell you this camera is really intelligent, it isn't. The camera doesn't understand whether you want to photograph the branch or whether you want to photograph this orangey thing behind the branch. It doesn't know what the subject is. Only you know that. So in this particular case, you just have to be careful to make sure the camera doesn't suddenly decide to focus on the branch. In this particular case, all the birds, in this case cormorants in the tree, are at approximately the same distance. And it doesn't really matter whether you, photo, uh, whether you focus on the tree or photo on the birds. Everything comes out looking fine. And in this particular case, the bird is focused nicely, mainly because there are no obscuring branches or leaves in front of the bird. And naturally, the background is out of focus if the bird is nice and sharp. So sometimes it works fine. Sometimes you have to just keep your eye open as to what the camera is doing. Sometimes you can get exceptionally close to animals, sometimes a little bit too close. OK, in this case, the tourists, me and my friends, are inside a safari van, so we're quite safe. But in this case, the lioness was only a few meters away, approximately the distance between you and me at present, that sort of distance. And when an animal gets that close, you have to decide, am I going to focus on the ears? Am I going to focus on the eyes? Am I going to focus on the whiskers? Maybe it doesn't make too much of a difference if the animal's face is relatively flat. And photographers will often tell you, 
always photograph, uh, always focus on the eyes. That's probably a fairly good rule of thumb. I often focus on the whiskers just because the whiskers are nice and clear. White whiskers on a dark background usually show up nicely, and the camera finds it very easy to focus on those. But given a choice, focus on the eyes if you can. Sometimes, of course, the animal is moving. And simply to say, make sure the animal's in focus is not as simple as it sounds. Because if the animal is moving, you are either going to be continually readjusting the focus, or you hope that your camera is automatically focusing and adjusting focus as the animal is moving towards you or away from you. In this particular case, our driver guide said, don't bother taking a picture of that leopard over there, because if we drive over here, just a few, um, a few tens of meters over to the left, that leopard is on the way to a watering hole, so I know that if we go over there, the leopard will just walk straight past us. Leopards don't care about tourists. Again, as long as we shoot with cameras, not rifles, that's fine. So our driver guide basically knew what he was doing and said, let's go over here. And he, we moved the, the safari van. We parked up a little way up the hill. And lo and behold, the leopard walked straight past us. And then you get not the entire leopard in your field of view, but you get a beautiful shot of a head and shoulders, where again, in this particular case, I focused on the whiskers to make sure that it was as sharp as it could be as the leopard went past. Here we have uh, another cormorant, uh, beautifully reflected in the lake. So I liked the composition of this one. But do bear in mind that when you're photographing something like this, the bird is actually at a different distance to the reflection. We're sort of looking down onto the water. So if we focus on the bird, the reflection is slightly out of focus. Maybe it doesn't show too badly on here. If you're looking at it on a big screen or if you wanted to print it up into a big poster, it would show that the bird and the reflection are not both in focus at the same time. And you can't always choose the right aperture or shutter speed to make sure they're both in focus. And so it's fairly obvious in this sort of situation, focus on the bird and let the reflection take care of itself. And just keep your fingers crossed that the reflection is sharp enough to be interesting. In this particular case, I saw these impala, a mother and a baby impala, coming along. And I wasn't sure exactly where they were going to be. But I saw the behavior of earlier impala who don't seem to like walking over muddy ground, so they tended to jump over it. So I thought, great, I'll be able to catch these two leaping over this little muddy bit of water. But I wasn't sure exactly where they were going to be, so I focused on the grass. And unfortunately, the impala weren't quite at the same distance as the grass when they chose to make the jump. So although it's a nice sort of dynamic picture to see mother and fawn jumping at the same time, unfortunately, they are not quite as sharp as I would like. But you can't always get it right. You do the best you can. Sometimes it works well. Sometimes it doesn't. It's a, perhaps a little bit of a confusing photo because you think, well, where's the sky? Um, th there's water, and that's... Well, if that's sky, why is that bird upside down, and what's that? It's, it's actually two pools of water that just happen to be next door to each other. So that's basically land, water, land, water, and then land again. But this was a little spit that was just joining these two lakes together, these two pools of water together. Let's think about lighting. It's always good to use natural light. Basically, I never use flash even to try and fill in shadows. I try and use whatever light is available. Some people who try to catch birds, especially birds in a tree in the deep shade, will sometimes use a flash to try and augment whatever natural light is around because some birds in trees will find the darkest, shadiest spot possible. So sometimes fill in flash is a good idea. I don't tend to use that myself. I try to use whatever light is available. When going out on safaris looking for animals, quite often you go out first thing in the morning or last thing in the afternoon. In other words, just after sunrise or just before sunset. In Kenya, for instance, the rules are you don't go out at night. So you can't go out until sunrise, and you must be back by sunset. Sometimes you only spend a few hours out. Sometimes you might spend all day out on the Masai Mara or the Serengeti, whichever uh, grassland you happen to be visiting, or whatever national park you happen to be visiting. So sometimes the sunlight is not ideal. Sometimes the sun is overhead. 
In this particular case, you can see the, uh, the wonderful fur of this particular animal, a water buck, and it comes out very nicely, but the lighting is not really ideal, as the lighting is sort of overhead. And you can see that explicitly in this picture of a, a zebra foal. It's a nice enough picture, but if you notice its shadow, you can see that basically its shadow is directly underneath it. So the sun is overhead. This must have been taken around about noon. Kenya is on the equator, which means the sun rises at about 6, sets at about 6, and is noon at about noon overhead. That doesn't change much when you're on the equator. You tend to forget that when you're in northern latitudes. But in this case, OK, a nice picture of a baby foal, but the lighting is not great because the lighting is simply directly over the top of the foal. If the lighting is in a slightly different position, in other words, a different time of day, earlier in the morning or later in the afternoon, then you can get a bit of more interesting light. So for instance, here, the main part of the sunlight is over to the top right-hand side of the picture, and it's tending to illuminate a little part of the animal more from behind than from directly above, and that makes it slightly more interesting. And if you catch it right, then you can catch the sunlight, for instance, illuminating part of the fur, or in this case, the beard of uh, in, uh, this uh, wildebeest, um, and again, that's much more interesting than having just direct light from above. So a little portrait of two zebras just resting their heads. Again, a nice enough portrait, but again, the lighting isn't great because the lighting is just from above. Whereas if you catch the lighting right, you get a much, much nicer portrait. So this particular image of zebra is one of my favorites, partly because it's a family group, but partly because of the illumination, the lighting. The uh, sun is over in the top left-hand side. This was taken shortly after sunrise, and so the light is just catching uh, a little bit of the baby fluff of the, of the young zebras, and it's just catching the ears of the adult zebra, and it's just catching the seed heads of the grass that these particular zebra happen to be munching on. And I just think that's a much nicer family portrait, a much no better lighting for a family portrait than the previous images. And if you go out on a game drive late in the afternoon, you might not get back to your tent or your lodge until nearly sunset. And so the last half hour of a game drive often gives you the opportunity of dramatic images. In this case, the sun is almost set and is entirely backlighting this particular zebra who's just kicking up a little bit of dust as it goes about its business. And similarly here, with a number of zebra that are on a march, I don't know where they're coming from, I don't know where they're going to, but the sunlight is just catching the dust as they tromp their way along the plains. This particular shot was taken at sunrise. We were just about to leave a particular lodge. All of the camera gear was in the backpack or in the cases. We were just about to leave, and I looked over my shoulder, and I saw in the watering hole the reflection of these antelope, these eland. They're the largest antelope in East Africa. And in this particular case, the, the rising sun was just catching these antelope as they were coming down to drink, and that you got this beautiful reflection in the water. So although our driver wanted to whisk us away to the next destination and all our camera gear was packed away, we insisted that we stop, unpack the camera gear, get a few pictures in the last few minutes, just as the sun was rising, before heading off to our next destination. So again, you could put that in the serendipity category of sometimes you just get lucky. We could have just left that particular venue, that particular lodge, not looked back and missed the fact that we get a beautiful reflection of the eland as they come down to drink at the watering hole. And whenever you have animals close to water, you always have the option of not only nice lighting, you have the options of reflections, just like I showed of the eland and the watering hole. This wasn't a watering hole, this was just a flooded plain, but there's always the option of just catching one or more animals reflected in still water. Let's have a think about shutter speed and lens apertures. Getting a little more technical, but for those of you who know your photography, this might be quite interesting. So again, it's about keeping the subject sharp, not by making sure it's in focus, but by making sure it doesn't blur too much. 
So if we've got an object like this, uh, a butterfly, we're looking down on it from above, this particular butterfly in the undergrowth has found a nice shady spot, so there's not a huge amount of light available. This is one instance where maybe a fill-in flash might have helped a little bit, but in this particular section, when I'm talking about shutter speeds and apertures, I will put the shutter speed and aperture down the bottom for anybody that's actually interested in those numbers, as it were. So remember, if the lens is wide open, that limits the depth of field, how much of the um, field of view is going to be in focus. And if we have the aperture quite wide, we let in a lot of light, but we have to be very careful with the focus. If we were to close the lens down, then it would make it easier to focus, but we would need a longer shutter speed because we were letting less light into the camera. So there's always a trade-off between how much light you let in by deciding on what the aperture of the lens is going to be versus how long you have to expose for. In this particular case, f4 um, gave me an exposure of 1 400th of a second, but f4 was not a problem because a butterfly with its wings out is essentially flat. All of the butterfly was at the same distance from the camera, and so all of the butterfly is in focus. So that wasn't a problem for this particular, um, this particular subject. But occasionally, um, it is a problem. In this case, heading towards the lodge, again, heading towards sunset, very much heading towards dusk. Light levels were falling quite dramatically. The camera was almost packed away, but I had it on the seat next to me. And lo and behold, what happens as we're driving along a dirt track, two cheetahs come running alongside, not hunting, just playing probably two brothers that were doing nothing other than having a bit of a frolic, and they just happened to be running alongside the van for a few seconds. So I grabbed the camera, pointed at them, and clicked away. But even at f4, the exposure was a 40th of a second, and Cheetah, one of the fastest land mammals in existence, was outpacing the, uh, the, the uh, safari van that we were in, and hence um, I did not manage to catch them nice and sharp. But that sort of doesn't matter because a blurring, in this case blurring because there isn't much light, actually gives quite a nice impression of the fact that cheetah actually move quite fast. It's a bit of a, you know, it's not quite right in the sense that part of that blurring is because the cheetah are moving and part of the blurring is because I'm trying to follow them with a relatively slow shutter speed. But you can tell that the legs of the cheetah are moving by the, the streaks that you get of the spots, telling you it's not just a blur because of me panning the camera, it's definitely a blur because of the movement of the cheetah. And in the next fraction of a second, when I tried to get a second shot off, again, you can see the grass is blurred because I was panning the camera, but also you can see the tail of the cheetah is whipping up as it tries to counterbalance the fact that it suddenly decided to take a, a turn, just as it does when it's hunting its favorite uh, food, like a uh, Thompson's gazelle. With aperture, one thing you can do is to say, well, I know how far it is to my subject, and I know I want to focus on the bird, but I definitely want to throw the background as out of focus as possible. So that's one instance in which you do want to open up the lens to the largest aperture you can get away with, because you can focus on the object, and with a large aperture, the background will definitely be out of focus. If you were to have a smaller aperture, then more would be in focus, and you would still get the bird as crisp, but you would get a lot more confusion in the background of whatever that is. The bush in the background of the bird would show up detail, and that would detract from the beauty of the particular subject you're dealing with. So here, the bird is quite a few meters in front of the bush behind it, and therefore, by choosing a relatively wide aperture here, f5.6, okay, that gives me a slightly longer exposure, but the bird isn't moving, so that doesn't matter. 125th of a second is enough to freeze a bird that isn't moving. It's not like a cheetah running away from you. So that gives you a nice way of getting a portrait of a bird that's uh, standing out nicely from its background. Same sort of idea here, a, a goshawk that just happened to land in a bush not too far away. And again, by choosing a, a relatively large aperture, in this case f5.6, uh, quite a high shutter speed because this thing is in full sunshine, so there's plenty of light around. So clearly there's lots of detail in the bush that it's standing on. That's at the same distance as the bird, so of course that's going to be in focus but with a nice large aperture, most of the detail behind the bird is nicely out of focus, and so the bird itself, the goshawk, stands out nicely against 
the background. We've already seen this one, this uh, male lion who is posing for us by sort of squinting into the breeze to get its mane uh, moving quite nicely in the breeze. And again, uh, by choosing the right aperture, we can get the background reasonably out of focus. So the lion is crisp, but the background is slightly blurred, making it stand out just a little bit uh, better. In this particular case, there was a limitation to how much you could say, well, I'd like it to be a large aperture or I'd like it to be a small aperture. In this particular case, we have a number of bee eaters. Uh, there's always one or two that decide to have their back to you. They don't always cooperate like you see in certain magazines. In this case, I focused on these. And this one on the right, you can see, is a little bit closer to us. The branch is going away as you go further and further down the branch. So the bee eater on the right-hand side is a little bit closer and is slightly out of focus. And if you look at the apertures down here, F4, why did I use F4? Why didn't I close it down a little bit? Why didn't I go to F5, 6 or F8 or F11, which would have given me a greater depth of focus and would have guaranteed that all four birds were in focus? Well, I could have done that, but in this particular case, remember aperture and the shutter speed are always trading off against each other. Had I closed down the lens, I would have had a much, uh, much longer exposure than one thousandth of a second. Why does that matter? Well, because that picture was taken with the birds on a riverbank, and I was in a boat, and I was moving backwards and forwards, and I couldn't afford to have a long exposure because it would have blurred because I was not absolutely steady. I didn't have the camera on a tripod. I didn't have it resting on anything steady. I was just in a riverboat, and that riverboat was just moving backwards and forwards. So I needed a reasonably fast shutter speed to guarantee that the birds didn't blur because of my camera shake or camera movement. And that, unfortunately, meant I had to have the lens wide open. And that means this chap on the right is slightly out of focus. But clearly, as he's got his back to us anyway, he doesn't want to be photographed, so that's OK. When it comes to photographing birds in flight, you do have a bit of a dilemma. The bird's distance to you is continuously changing, so are you going to continually try and make sure that the focus is right? Are you going to close down the aperture to try and give yourself the depth of field so it doesn't matter too much if the distance to the bird varies? But remember the bird is moving and you want to keep the exposure, the shutter speed as high as possible, the exposure as short as possible, because this bird is moving in the sky and you're trying to follow it uh, to catch the particular image. So there it's a bit tricky to decide what is the best combination. And I would argue quite often it's best just let the camera decide. Don't try and override it. If you're trying to catch something in flight and it's weaving backwards and forwards, let the camera take control of the aperture and the shutter speed and keep your fingers crossed that the combination you end up with is good enough. In this particular case, one of the vultures decided to have a scrap with another couple of vultures. So a fight ensued, and the fight lasted for a few minutes. So it was possible to say, well, these things are moving quite fast, but they seemed to be sort of at the same distance. They were jumping off the ground, scrapping with each other, landing on the ground again. So the distance was reasonably constant, so I could uh, catch this one. And again, something of order a thousandth of a second was enough to freeze the action as these vultures were having a, a scrap with each other. Birds in flight, if they're soaring, then it's not too bad. The larger the bird, the slower they tend to move. And the large raptors, the eagles and the buzzards, etc., will tend to move relatively slowly. And if you're lucky and you're not too far away from a thermal, you can catch them as they're moving round and they're not moving too fast relative to your line of sight. And you can catch them, not always first time, the wonders of digital photography. You can take a few images. Some of them might be slightly blurred or slightly out of focus, but you can usually catch one in which the bird um, is large enough to give you an interesting picture and sharp enough to be in focus and with a, sh uh, a short enough shutter speed that it doesn't seem to have blurred during the exposure. So here, this auger buzzard was circling on a thermal not far away from where I was standing. So I got a few chances to try and catch it as it came around and around. Let's just think about context. The fact that you should always think about, you can't always control, but at least think about what the background of the animals are. 
in this particular case, this is a nondescript image of a few elephants, except that, and you can perhaps barely tell, I was trying to get Kilimanjaro in the background. So <laughs> Kilimanjaro is there, and perhaps you can just see the snow on the top there. Yeah, but it was a bit of a hazy day. I knew Kilimanjaro was there. I could see it clearly enough, but I figured that, yeah, when you take a picture, it's not always going to look quite as you would see it with your eyes. And if you expose correctly for the ground, that means the sky is probably slightly overexposed and any subtle detail in the sky is going to be not necessarily lost, but it's not going to be quite as clear as you would like. So that was the intention. That's why the horizon is so low. In the, that, sorry, that's not the horizon. That's just a, a set of trees in the distance. That's why it looks like the horizon is quite low, because I was intending to get this mountain in the background as well. So it sort of works, but perhaps doesn't project too well in this sort of environment. And in this particular case, we were doing nothing in particular other than parked up looking at some animals in the distance where out of the bush came this male elephant. And in this particular case, I did not zoom in to get just the elephant. I deliberately went to something closer to wide angle because I wanted to get the elephant in its environment. I wanted to get the elephant coming out of the bush. Other people have seen this, and some photographers have told me, ah, you should have zoomed in on the elephant and just got the elephant rather than the elephant and the bush. But in a sense, that wasn't why I took that picture. I took that picture because I thought it was a nice elephant framed by the elephant's environment. You can tell this isn't in a zoo because of all the bushes around. So I thought that was quite a nice picture because of the environment, not necessarily because of the elephant itself. The fact that the elephant with its trunk was picking up some dirt and throwing the dirt over its back, that just added a little nice element to the picture itself. Giraffes can be very curious, and in this particular case, perhaps you can't see, some of them might be looking at us, but a lot of these giraffes are actually looking at something that's in the bottom right, way off screen, as it were, outside the picture. So perhaps there's some predator lurking around somewhere down in the grass there, where a lot of these giraffes seem to be looking down in one particular place. As a general hint, that's a good way of finding animals in the bush. Giraffes have got a great viewpoint so you don't necessarily look for animals down in the grass. You look at what the giraffes are looking at. And if all the giraffes are looking in one direction and staring at something in one direction, there's something in the grass they've seen, and it might be worth going have a look at what it is that they have caught. A jackal, nice as a, uh, as a close-up as it came towards the van. And again, wasn't too fussed about us. It didn't seem too worried. It just trotted alongside the van. So in this particular case, some of the blurring is because the, I was following the jackal as it walked past. So as it happens, the head is reasonably sharp as I followed it, but some of the body and some of the background is a little bit blurred. But that's not how you normally see jackals, because jackals don't usually just appear right next to the safari van. Much more likely is you see something in the distance. Maybe you just see ears. And you get trained to sort of look for animals in the distance, and you say, is that a rhino? Oh, no, that's a rock. Sorry. OK. Is that a rhino? Oh, that's another rock. OK. And occasionally, you see a couple of ears pick up, and then you think, ah, yes, I can see some ears in the distance. That's definitely not two small rocks. There's definitely an animal there. And sometimes, you see the animal poke its head out of the grass in order to see what's going on. But of course, some animals will show themselves if they're looking for prey. But if the animals are prey, then they are trying not to show themselves. So you get this, this sort of dilemma that some animals are difficult to see because they are deliberately hiding from predators. And sometimes the grass is quite short, and you can see what's going on. And sometimes the grass is so high, uh, you can lose a giraffe in them. So depending on the time of year you go to grasslands like the Serengeti or the Masai Mara, sometimes the grass is very short. It depends on whether the wildebeest have been through and chopped the grass down to only a few millimeters, or whether the grass is still a meter high or something, uh, in which case you can certainly hide elephants and giraffe. But coming back to this picture, I make no excuse for showing it twice because it's one of my favorites. But again, this just reminds you that sometimes the grass is long, but sometimes if the wildebeest have already been through, then the grass is down to perhaps just, uh, just a few centimeters, but that's still enough to um, support an ecosystem of all the other animals other than the two million wildebeest that have just plowed their way through 
munching as they go. An African jacana, a beautiful bird, uh, a relative, well, it's part of the lily trotter family, so perhaps you know the, uh, the equivalent in Europe. And again, you can see why it's a lily trotter, because you can see it trotting on the lilies. An alternative is to say, well, that's a nice picture, but you could have just sort of said, well, let's just concentrate on the bird. Fine, it's a beautiful bird, especially that sort of blue cap on its forehead there. Yes, it is a beautiful bird, but I think the environment is even more important. And that tells you that that bird is a lily trotter because you can see it trotting on this lake full of lilies. So again, that's an example where you wouldn't necessarily want to zoom in and crop on the animal itself rather than the animal in its natural environment. Serendipity. Sometimes you can't plan these things. Sometimes you can say, I want a picture of this, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to sit here with the camera on the tripod and wait until this happens. But quite often, that's not boring, but that's not as much fun as simply going out there and saying, let's drive that away and see what we see. And sometimes we'll get lucky and find some interesting things. Some game drives are not boring, but some game drives are less productive than others, you might go out for an hour or two and not see that many animals worth photographing. On other days, you might go out and come back with 500 interesting-looking images. So it is pretty much just luck. One op option you have is to go on a safari, stay in a tented camp or in a lodge. This particular lodge is in um, Savo, which is uh, southeast of Nairobi in Kenya. And this particular lodge called Kilaguni has a terrace that overlooks a watering hole. This is one of my favorite places on Earth. It means that if you wish, if you spend a few days at this lodge, you don't have to go out looking for the animals. If you wish, you can just park yourself on this terrace and you can sit there with your camera, with your binoculars, with your bird book, whatever, sit on the terrace, and all day long, OK, not in this particular picture, but all day long, some animals will be coming to the watering hole. Some animals come during the night, some come in the early morning, some come later in the afternoon. But there is, generally speaking, always a queue of animals. You can't see them, but there are animals in the bush here waiting their turn to come to the watering hole. And if you wish, you can just sit there and people will bring you coffee every once in a while, or perhaps more alcoholic beverages if you prefer. And the restaurant is also there as well. So as you have your lunch, dinner, whatever, you can again look out over the watering hole. So you don't have to go on game drives to find animals to photograph. If you wish, you can just wait by a watering hole, and eventually they will come to you. But serendipitously, I think it's more fun to go out and see what can you see. Occasionally, you get sites like that a bird whose head has exploded, apparently. It took a few seconds to work out what on earth we had just photographed until it turned round, and then we realized it was simply a bird that, like many owls, for instance, they can rotate their heads through large angles. Uh, many raptors can do that. And if it turns its head through 180 degrees, then the feathers on the back of its neck simply get ruffled, and it gives you that rather odd um, impression there on the left. Also, if you wait by a watering hole, you don't necessarily catch uh, an antelope deciding to stand on its hind legs because it wants to get to some of the higher, um, juicier parts of this particular bush. So these, partic these antelopes, called jaranuk, they sometimes stand on their hind legs and go rummaging in the bushes. You don't catch that if you're just waiting by a watering hole to see what comes to drink. In this particular instance, I was interested in taking a photograph of this crowned crane on the left-hand side that was standing on top of a tree. And I, I saw it standing there, so I uh, asked the driver to stop driving and then looked at the tree and thought, yeah, I can, I can get that with a 300 millimeter lens. And just before I took the picture of the single crowned crane, I noticed in the distance over here somewhere, its partner, its mate, flying towards the tree. And so I just waited a few seconds until that second bird arrived to land on the top of the tree next door to its mate. And of course, as a bird comes in to land, the air brakes go out and the wings come out like that. And you get a beautiful image of the bird trying to slow down and land 
on the top of this tree. So that was pure luck that I happened to be pointing the camera at the right bird at the right time just a few seconds before this second bird decided to land. If we had arrived there 10 seconds later, or perhaps 30 seconds earlier, I would not have obtained that particular photograph. Lions are easy. Lions are always easy because they're predators and they hunt at night, which means during the day they've got nothing to do. So they just sit around sleeping. They sometimes find shady spots. They sometimes just lie in the open. They don't care about tourists because tourists don't worry them. And therefore, they will either sit there sleeping while you can photograph them, or in this particular case, a couple of youngsters are just play fighting. And so we could watch them for quite a few minutes, quite happily, and get some nice images of the lions. Unlike, remember, the, uh, the prey animals, which are more skittish, lions, easy. Because they're nocturnal, because they don't do anything during the day, they're just sleeping. So it's almost a question of if you go out in Africa, you'll trip over some lions somewhere. There's bound to be them there. They're easy to catch on film. Occasionally, you catch uh, a mother and some youngsters. In this case, the youngster having breakfast shortly after sunrise. And you can see how leisurely it is for the mum in this particular case. Yes, they tend to find shade. But they do find shade, but usually speaking, there isn't so much shade that you can't actually see lions as you're driving along. You, you simply notice that that particular tree seems to have some fawn stuff around it. Oh, there's a group of lions. There's a pride sitting over there having a snooze. Sometimes with youngsters, you don't always get lucky enough to find a pride of lions with some uh, young cubs around, but every once in a while, you will find that. You do have to worry about the fact that the, uh, the lionesses can be quite protective if there are cubs around, but as long as you don't threaten them, they're basically quite happy. Same is true of cheetahs. Um, sometimes you find cheetahs doing nothing but walking around. Sometimes you find them hunting. Every once in a while, you're lucky enough to find them with some cubs, cute as they are. Again, as long as you don't look like you're hassling them, the mothers are quite happy for you to be not that many meters away from their cubs. One of my friends, whilst we're out driving, said, what's that over there? And we said, what's that over where? He said, that in the tree. No, oh, oh, you mean that in the tree. It's probably just an antelope leg. It's probably some kill that's been dragged up there and forgotten about, and so there's nothing particularly interesting there. Why don't we go and have a look anyway? Oh, what the hell? Yep. Oh, it's not an antelope. Ah, oh, it's a lion. OK, it's a lion asleep in a tree, as lions do, of course, yeah. So this particular one happened to find some shade, not much shade, as you can see there, but that was enough. So, yeah, you don't know what you're going to find. You must always keep an open mind and not say, we want to go and see lion, or we want to go and see elephant, or we want to see a rhino. It's far better just to say, whatever's out there, let's just drive and see what we see. Once we went towards a lake where we were expecting to see one or two flamingo, and as we arrived, a thousand pelicans decided to take off from the lake and then sort of wheel around above our heads. So we've seen a few pelicans before, but we've never really seen a thousand pelicans in one go. This is not the whole flock. This is just what I could fit in with the lens I had available at the time. But the idea of seeing big birds in such big numbers, thousands of pelicans and perhaps tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of flamingo, at the various lakes that are part of the Great Rift Valley that run through East Africa can be quite an incredible sight. One time in 2019, we visited a national park, which we have visited before on previous safaris, but it was always dry. And in 2019, we visited a place where we would normally expect a vast, dusty plain, and instead, we were treated with a lake where there didn't used to be one. It wasn't as a result of unusual rainfall that year. I don't know quite what had happened. I think the water table had changed for some reason. Most of the water in these regions are runoff from Kilimanjaro. But for some reason, in this area, a lake appeared over a period of a week or two, even though it hadn't been particularly heavy rain. So the zebra were confused as us. The zebra wanted to go from A to B, and they always go from A to B by walking across this particular dusty plain. Now it's full of water. 
but they still go from A to B. They don't go around the lake, they go the way they always have gone. And if that means sloshing through a lake, you can see it's not particularly deep, it's less than half a metre, probably only a quarter of a metre deep. Not particularly deep, but they still moved exactly the same way on exactly the same route because they knew that they wanted to go from there to there and they normally did it this way, so the fact that it's now full of water is neither here nor there. So we parked up and just took pictures of these zebra sloshing their way through this particular lake. And this particular image, um, I like this for a number of different reasons, partly because it's unusual and partly because um, the, the flamingo in the background are slightly out of focus. I focused on the zebra deliberately and the uh, flamingo are now slightly out, out of focus and it gives this slightly oil painting type of uh, appearance, this impression in the distance of lots of flamingo. And as the flamingo get closer and closer and closer to the zebra, they resolve themselves from little pink blobs in the distance to clearly flamingo sitting in the foreground. And it's this sort of depth that you get with the zebra being sharp and the objects in the distance in the background getting further and further and further out of focus as we go meters and meters and meters further back to the tree line at the edge of the lake there. So it's partly a nice picture and it's partly one of my favorites because it was so unexpected. There's no way we expected to get that picture because when we visited that national park we expected it to be as dry as it had been in previous visits. Another mother and baby picture, which is just, a, oh, isn't that cute sort of moment with the, the little youngster trying to get attention from its mother whilst, um, whilst munching away on the grass there. And as I've said before, you can get close. Even animals that could in principle be prey to big cats, in this particular case there were no big cats in the area, so this particular um, water buck in this particular case was not particularly skittish, was not particularly worried about having visitors within 10 or 20 or 30 metres of it, so you could quite happily get close with a telephoto lens and get some very nice close-ups of the animal. Same is true of birds. If they're in a tree, there's no reason why you can't get fairly close to the tree and then look up at the bird. This particular one is an African fish eagle. And of course, the beauty of digital photography is you can take a picture and if you've got a reasonable number of pixels in your camera, you can decide to crop it differently and you don't have to worry about the film grain that you would if you were taking images with old-fashioned film. Everybody remember old-fashioned film? Yeah? Okay, with digital photographs, there's generally speaking not a problem to take that image of the whole bird and say, well, actually, I think the picture of just the head is quite nice. With enough pixels, you don't have to worry about grain. If the original image was in focus, then you can crop it down and still produce some nice crops. Same with cheetah. Cheetah aren't too worried if you get close. This particular one had just fed. We saw it eating part of a carcass off to one side, and it happened to stroll past us. Again, not too worried about our presence. This one looked a little too interested in us, um, so we weren't quite sure whether it was threatening or not. This one sort of came out of the grass and stared at us rather intently, and we weren't too sure whether it was threatening or not. Maybe this lioness, like the one I showed earlier, maybe this lioness had cubs somewhere in the long grass and was worried about us getting too close. So in this particular case, as the lioness started to stalk towards us, we just slowly backed off because we didn't want to give the impression that we were intruding on her family. But this is just an indication that sometimes they do visit. This is the what I was greeted with outside my tent one morning. So uh, there's the tents. We're told, do not leave the tents at night because it's dangerous. We thought, ha, dangerous. What do they know? Uh, but we decided to obey the rules and not leave the tent at night. And then when I came out of the tent the next morning, I found that paw print. And I'm told that that's a lioness's paw print. So the idea of, for instance, doing astrophotography, which of course I love to do, 
go to Africa, see animals by day, take pictures of the stars at night. So the idea of let's set up a camera here to you know, get away from the trees and do some astrophotography, fantastic idea, except that astrophotography with lionesses around is probably not such a good idea. So this particular venue, this, this was governor's camp on the Masai Mara, this particular venue is not a good one for doing astrophotography. When friends and I, who are interested in animals and interested in astronomy, go out to Africa, we try and choose some camps or lodges that are good for astronomy and others that might not be. We have a mix so that we can always do some astrophotography while we're out there. This one, fantastic for animals, not so good for looking at the stars. So, have you had enough yet? And he yawns all round. Okay, there's plenty of animals getting bored. Yeah, there's a hippo in the distance there. That was, that was very serendipitous to happen to catch that leopard in a tree. Uh, we were wondering what it was going to do other than sleep. But when it gave us a full-faced yawn right down the camera, you can see its tonsils from here, can't you? It's, uh, it's, that's just sort of lucky that we're in the right place at the right time. This particular lion, you're wondering, it seems to have a bit of a scar on its jaw. And you're thinking, is it going to yawn? It is going to yawn. Has it only got one tooth at the front? And the answer is no, it's got two teeth at the front, it's just a very lopsided yawn. Uh, because of the scarring on its, uh, on its uh, face, it just finds it very lopsided to give a yawn. But it's fine, it's like most lions, it's just lazy during the day and it just takes a little bit longer to do a yawn than anything else. So, okay, so what? And if you are going to go to interesting places in the world to do wildlife photography, don't forget that sometimes it's worth just taking a picture of the view, whether it be a storm over the Masai Mara or whether it be early morning light glinting through some of the grass. It's always worth asking yourself. There's no animals there, but it's still a pretty picture. Take it anyway. That's what Kilimanjaro should look like. Um, that's on a nice clear day. Still some clouds around, of course, but again, you can see... The, the land gets very hazy as you look into the distance and then the land sort of disappears because it's many tens of miles away by the time you get to that and then eventually Kilimanjaro pokes its head above the clouds there. So Kilimanjaro is actually in Tanzania. This picture was taken from Kenya. So the mountain is actually in a different country to the photographer in this particular case. But it would have been nice to get some elephant with that in the background. And there, there are some others that I've got, but I was just making the point earlier that sometimes uh, nature doesn't always work in your favor, and sometimes uh, the backdrop looks fantastic, and sometimes it doesn't look quite as crisp as you remember it. There's always dramatic sunsets. If you're in the middle of Africa, there's always an opportunity to get a sunset behind an acacia tree or something like that. Let me finish with the ones that got away. Back in the day of using film, again, people remember that, yes, if you went on safari, you would take enough film with you. You would try and guess, how many pictures am I going to take? Yeah, I can get 36 exposures on a roll of film. How many rolls of film am I going to take? 10, 15, 20? Is that going to be enough? And when you're out there taking pictures of animals, you say to yourself, well, this is the uh, seventh roll that I've got through, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm almost at my 36. Do I take a picture of that animal, or do I save it in case a more interesting animal comes along in five minutes' time? With digital photography, you don't have that quandary. If you want, you can buy yourself an SD card with a terabyte of storage. Yes, a thousand gigabytes, a million megabytes. So, okay, not particularly cheap, but you can just take pictures forever and not worry about what pictures you're taking. So what tends to happen is rather than wait until the perfect moment, with digital photography, you often snap and hope for the best. In this particular case, there was a beautiful bird sitting here building a nest. And I thought, oh, I'll grab that. Chunk. Nope. In the tenth of a second or two tenths of a second it took me to decide to take the picture the bird had flown off. Big birds move slowly, little birds can move at what seems like about half the speed of light when it comes to moving outside the frame. So I've got quite a few pictures of branches with no birds. If you like I'll show you, I can have a two hour session in which I show you <laughs> all the pictures of branches that used to have birds on them but not when I took the picture. And every once in a while, you see animals coming towards you thinking, oh, what a beautiful portrait of a mother and foal. 
and in the time it takes you to grab the camera that's sitting on your seat and bring it up to your eye, in that one or two seconds, they've decided, no, they don't like the look of you, and they turn around and head off into the distance. So, again, another two-hour lecture on bum shots, if you like, of animals that were originally coming towards us and then decided not to. That's very common with antelopes who are a little bit skittish and they might not think you're a threat, but you're just something unusual and therefore they'd prefer to go somewhere else. And so lots of pictures of antelope walking away from you are very, very common. And in terms of being too slow, sometimes it's the shutter speed that's too slow. And you can see here, well, what can you see here? Uh, is it a handkerchief? Uh, is it... Uh, no, you, you can perhaps just get the impression of two lobes there. That is a bird flapping its wings. Um, but I was too slow in A, grabbing the camera, and I hadn't noticed that the shutter speed was too slow. Again, the light was failing, and I probably wouldn't have been able to take this picture particularly well, even had I had the right conditions in terms of aperture and shutter speed. But here, the shutter speed was a fraction of a second, and the bird was flapping its wings many times per second, and so all I ended up with was a very blurred bird. And again, I've got plenty of those. So the... the the rest of this picture showing you a sharp starling or a sharp African fish eagle, etc. They, of course, are the best of the bunch in the sense that I've got plenty that I've taken in the hope of it working, and it turns out not to be that. In the days of film, that was very expensive. In the days of fit digital photography, who cares that every good image has got half a dozen mediocre images or bad images or didn't quite work images behind it? So don't forget that although in principle you can think about composition and focus and lighting and shutter speed and aperture and the context of what your animals are in, in terms of their environment, and of course sometimes you can't plan, you just have to get lucky. All of these factors are, I wouldn't say necessarily important, they're all factors that you could, if you wish, consider when you're doing your own photography, including what you're doing in your back garden. So this is our family cat. I took this, I can't remember when, I think it was about in the mid-70s. I, well, I think I was a school kid at the time. It's black and white simply because it's not artistic to take black and white pictures. I couldn't afford colour photography at the time, being a school kid. But you could argue the same rules apply. You still have to make sure it's in focus. If you can, make sure the background is reasonably blurred so that the subject stands out as much as possible in this particular picture. The real trick with this particular image, you can perhaps see that the, the cat is pouring, and that those who know cats know that that means the animal is wanting to be stroked and is about to run towards you saying hi. So trying to catch this particular cat our family cat, before she decided to come towards us to say hi, that was a question of just catching it just at the right moment. So all of the various, not rules, but all of the various considerations I've given you about how to optimize your wildlife photography, remember they apply to little cats in the garden as well as big cats in Africa. Thank you for listening. <laughs>